Welcome back, everybody. In today's video, we're going to get a very brief overview of some basic hyperparameter tuning for a deep Q learning agent in the Acme framework from DeepMind. Now, this question came up because in the previous video, I gave an overview of the framework and I presented the use of a couple agents, a DQN and a DDPG, without any real hyperparameter tuning. Uh, the question was asked, hey, can you do a video on hyperparameter tuning? So here we are. So the first thing I want to take a look at is the variety of agents available to us from the Acme framework. You can see there are a whole bunch of algorithms here. And honestly, I'm not incredibly familiar with all of these. I know Impala, R2D2, uh, MCTS is Monte Carlo Tree Search, obviously DQN and DDPG. We also have D4PG, which is a distributed distributional uh, deep deterministic policy gradients method, I believe. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, but keep in mind, this is a single threaded version. So that just gives you an idea of the number of agents. Now, actually, it's not as broad as something like, say, the RayLib implementation of distributed deep reinforcement learning agents, but it is certainly uh, a wide variety of agents. Now, if we take a look at the DQN itself, we can see that there are a whole bunch of parameters that get passed in. All we did was pass in the environment spec and uh, a network, which we used the uh, pre-supplied networks from DeepMind. Other parameters we can play with are the batch size. Uh, that's one hyperparameter I changed. I set it, I believe, to 32. 256 is a little bit large. Other things we can do are the target update period. That tells us how often we want to copy the networks from the online network to the target network. Samples per insert, I think that has to do with how the data is stored. Min and max replay size are fairly self-explanatory. I do change this variable because the uh, replay size does play a large role in memory consumption because we are storing, uh, even though they're relatively small scrimmages, they do take up a fair amount of, of RAM in your machine. Important sampling exponent and priority exponent have to do with the prioritized experience replay hyperparameters. Uh, this agent is using prioritized experience replay because it's, you know, why would they not? It's, you know, the cutting edge state of the art replay memory for deep Q learning agents, so you may as well use it. End step has to do with the number of steps with which we take the returns. So in my courses, for instance, and in most implementations that you've seen of deep Q learning, you probably use single step where you're just taking a single time step out of your replay buffer and computing the temporal difference over that over two successive time steps. Well, there's no law that says you can only take two successive time steps. You can take, say, five successive time steps, which is what they're doing here. Another hyperparameter, an obvious one, is the epsilon for epsilon greedy action selection. Now, this defaults to a value of none, and if you don't supply something, it defaults to 0 0.05. Now, I supply a value of 0 0.1, uh, reason being that is the final value they settle on in the original paper where it'll decay from 1 down to 0 0.1 over something like a million frames. Of note, uh, in this implementation of deep Q learning, they don't actually do uh, a DK schedule for the epsilon. So that's something to take note of. And I do indeed get learning with a uh, constant value of 0 0.1. And you probably get, you know, learning with 0 0.05 as well. I don't think it's all that critical. Obviously, the learning rate has to do with the learning rate for your deep neural network. The discount is just the gamma from your um, update equation. Uh, you have loggers. Interestingly, even though we don't supply one and it defaults to none, we, stu we do still get logging, so I'd have to do a little bit more of a look in the code to see about that. Uh, checkpointing stuff. And also, somewhat interestingly, you can supply a policy network. Now, if you don't supply a policy network, it uses the usual epsilon greedy policy uh, that we've come to expect for deep Q learning, but it's kind of interesting. You can indeed choose something other than epsilon greedy. Now, there's also the max gradient norm that has to do with how the gradients are computed when you're doing the learning. Now, we can scroll down and you get explanations of all of these um, kind of interesting stuff, more or less what I just described. And then if you scroll down further, you get a little bit of insight into Maybe if I zoom in a little bit, it'll be more clear for you. You get, whoa, <laughs> a little bit too far, right? Let's back it out a bit. So we get uh, a number of 
components here to a DeepMind Acme agent. You can see a replay table. I talked about that in the previous video. And there was another question regarding uh, the reverb module in Windows. Now, reverb is only designed to work in Linux-based operating systems, so I would assume it works in Mac as well since that's based on BSD and they're similar enough. However, Windows is going to have an issue. Now, I know that in Windows 10 there is a... Linux subsystem for Windows, which I did a little bit of tinkering with, but it was kind of convoluted to me and I'm dual booting Linux, so it just seems like I would just boot into Linux anyway. So if you're dead set on using Windows, you could probably try to learn a little bit about the Win the Linux subsystem for Windows and probably use that to install Reverb, although I don't know if that will work, that's just my suspicion. Then we have what's called an adder. An adder is the interface between the agent's experiences and the reverb client. What it deals with is how we're going to add our memories to the replay table. And you have an end step transition adder that adds a series of steps. You also have sequence adders that'll do um, arbitrary sequences, episode adders that'll do whole um, that will do whole episodes. If you set end to one and the end step transition adder, I believe it just becomes a regular transition adder, uh, although there may be a separate adder for that. We can take a look. So if we go to that, we can see end step transition adder, and then going up one directory, we can see what type of adders we have. So there is a regular, no, it's in transition. Okay, yeah, so setting n equals one does do the regular transition adder like we would use in a basic deep Q learning agent. And then you're going to need a client for interfacing with the server and then a data set, which is a, uh, a TensorFlow data set for drawing data from that particular data uh, client from Reverb to feed into the uh, TensorFlow deep neural networks. Then we have some other code associated with a policy network. Uh, and then we come down to uh, an actor. So the uh, the structure of the program is such that you have an agent that contains an actor, a data table, an adder, um, a reverb client, a reverb server, as well as a learner and some capabilities around checkpointing. So the actor is the actual policy. The learner handles the uh, updating of the gradients. So I like the way they structure this. It's relatively, lo it's obviously logical, you know, it, it makes a perfect amount of sense. I do things slightly differently, but this is a more extensible way. It's just taking my logic to the next level of how can we build out an entire framework around deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning. And so uh, I quite like it. So if you take a look at the learner, it uh, has its own set of uh, values you can pass to it. Um, all of it should be pretty much similar to what we saw for the uh, agent class. Nothing is particularly crazy here. And then you come down to the calculations of the loss, uh, the step function. You know, you can hear, here you can see the gradient tape calculation. So that should be familiar. All of this is relatively familiar stuff. So that is a really, really, really brief overview of the DeepQ Learning Agent, some of the hyperparameters you can play with. And now let's take a look at the terminal to see what type of results I got with just some very simple tweaks. Okay, so here we are back in our DQN Pi file. And I didn't do too many tweaks. One thing I did that you may find interesting is and I did a brief video earlier, I think in 2020, on this, on management of GPU memory in TensorFlow. Now, TensorFlow by default will try to reserve all of the RAM available on your GPU. And for most applications, at least in deep reinforcement learning, that is way, way overkill. At least in my case, I'm running a Titan, so it's uh, an RTX Titan, so 24 gigabytes of VRAM. We don't need that much for a simple deep neural network for a deep Q learning agent. And so you can use these lines of code here to uh, tell the TensorFlow library that you want to set memory growth to true, meaning you want it to reserve as little memory as possible and then request more memory as it becomes necessary. So you can add these lines of code if you followed along with the previous video, and this will uh, reduce memory usage for your GPU. Now, if we scroll down to the agent, the only parameter changes I really made were the epsilon learning rate, replay size, and batch size. As I said in the section on the code on the uh, library, I use an epsilon of 0.1. You can experiment with the default of 0.05. Uh, and as a, like an exercise to the viewer, I would say uh, copy the Acme library to your personal 
computer and then play around with the DQN agent to implement an Epsilon DK schedule. Now, the fact that they didn't do it is telling, so that probably tells you it's not necessary, uh, but it would be a good exercise for interfacing with this uh, framework and uh, learning how it works and getting some experience in modifying professional code. Uh, learning rate of 10 to the minus 4, I found 10 to the minus 3 to be a little bit high. Uh, max replay size of 50,000 and a batch size of 32. All of that gave me relatively decent results. And then running it, let me just double check to make sure it still runs. I didn't change anything or break anything as I often do. Uh, so it's loading the replay server. That's a good sign. And then it is saving a checkpoint, blah, blah, blah. And my machine is spooling up. Oh, uh, one other thing I want to point out, and I can show this to you momentarily, is that the CPU usage goes to 100%. And the reason it does so, like if I open a new window and do HTOP, you can see 100% pegged across almost all of the threads. And the reason that happens is because the reverb server takes up all of that CPU time. So the reverb server is multi-threaded by default, so it uses as many threads as it can to get maximum throughput of sampling of your data. Now, for something like this, I think it's overkill. You probably don't need it. Um, but that's the way they set it up because I'm sure at scale that's what you need. Uh, just something to be aware of if you go run something like R2D2 for playing around with it. The R2D2 algorithm in the original paper is indeed hyper-threaded. They use 256 actors uh, in parallel, uh, but the implementation they supply in the Acme library is only single-threaded. And so if you see high CPU usage, don't believe that it's the agent doing that. It's actually the reverb data table. Uh, one thing I did want to show is the C the GPU usage. So if you do NVIDIA-SMI, you can see on this bottom row here that uh, Python is only consuming like 845 megabytes of VRAM. Uh, as it spools up, it consumes a little bit more. So you can see that it is indeed dynamically allocating memory as it goes rather than consuming all of it. And it's going up to something like 1391. Still a far cry from the full uh, 24 gigabytes of VRAM available. So I'm going to stop that. And then if we take a look at what I ran yesterday, uh, you can see for Pong, I did Pong because Pong is super, super simple and easy to get good learning in a couple of hours. Uh, so this wall time, 7,596 7, seconds is a little over two hours. Episode return of two, that's a positive score, so it's learning. Negative five still indicates it's learning positive score of 11. Of course, the maximum positive score you can have is 21. That means the agent beat the default adversary 21 to 0. So it is learning high score 16 here. Uh, it does learn how to play the game in a couple hours. And I have no doubt that in Space Invaders, it would uh, eventually learn it as well. Though, of course, Space Invaders is a much more difficult and complex environment to navigate. So uh, that is the fundamentals of just very basic hyperparameter tweaking in in uh, Acme. Now, you could tweak the network architectures, but they do use the network architectures from the paper. So that matches what I did in my courses. So I knew that if I took the hyperparameters from my courses, I should get um, solid performance for the uh, agent here because it is an improvement. It's using the prioritized experience replay and end step transition. So it's going to be better than the dueling deep QN that I implemented for my courses because I don't have those innovations built in as of yet. So I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, go forth and play with this library. Add your own agents to it. It's a really great exercise to take a paper, implement the agent using the Acme framework because then you get experience not only in implementing papers on your own, but in interfacing with a world-class framework written by some of the top minds in the industry. And that in and of itself uh, is a skill set you have to learn as well, how to write code like them, how they structure code, what the logic of their code is, how to fit your stuff in with it, because it's non-trivial. It's not 
you know, incredibly difficult. It's not a PhD thesis or anything, but it is non-trivial and will take you some thought, some consideration, and uh, some careful design choices. Go ahead and leave a comment down below. Leave a like if you found this content useful, and I will see you in the next video.